going to begin with a story, and we'll go from there. So I do have a loud voice. Though. <laughs> All right. The nurse took the tired, anxious serviceman to the bedside and said, your son is here. To the old man. She had to repeat the word several times before the patient's eyes opened. Heavily sedated because of the pain of the heart attack, he dimly saw the young, uniformed Marine standing outside the oxygen tent. And he reached out his hand. The Marine wrapped his toughened fingers around the old man's limp one, squeezing a message of love and encouragement. The nurse brought a chair so that the Marine could sit beside the bed. All through the night, the young Marine sat there in the poorly lighted ward, holding this old man's hand and offering him words of love and of strength. Occasionally, the nurse suggested that the Marine move away and rest a while, but he refused. Whenever the nurse came into the ward, the Marine was oblivious of her and of the night noise of the hospital, the clanging of the oxygen tank, the laughter of the night staff members of exchanging greetings, the cries and moans of other patients. Now and then she heard him say a few gentle words. The dying man said nothing, only held tightly to his son all throughout the night. Along towards dawn, the old man died. The Marine released the now lifeless hand he had been holding and went to tell the nurse. While she did what she had to do, he waited. Finally, she returned. She started to offer words of sympathy. But the Marine interrupted her and asked her, who was that man? The nurse was startled. He was your father, she answered. No, he wasn't, said the Marine. I never saw him in my entire life. Then why didn't you say something when I took you to him? I knew right away there had been a mistake. But I also knew he needed his son. And his son just wasn't there. When I realized that he was too sick to tell whether or not I was his son, knowing how much he needed me, I stand. I came here tonight to find a Mr. William Gray. His son was killed in Iraq today, and I was sent to inform him. What was this gentleman's name? The nurse with tears in her eyes answered, Mr. William Gray. Compassion. We're talking about compassion. But we're also talking about the fuel behind that compassion, that energy, which is empathy. And empathy, sometimes we think of empathy as things that we say, but it's also through action. By reading people and seeing where they're at. And sometimes we don't even have to hear a single word. You can just see how they are. And this is what this man did for this older gentleman. You guys follow this? You understand? It's more. It's an action. The one personality trait I wish the world possessed in abundance is it. I believe we need to be stirred into feeling for others, compelled through our hearts to want to invest time to, as we heard in the song, walk in somebody else's shoes with the express purpose of getting into the mind of that individual to see the world through their eyes. I believe that the first cause of genuine feelings of compassion and love, precious, rich gifts of need, is empathy. I take the 
every life is precious approach. No matter what the situation. Withholding judgment. Always seeking to feel empathy for those who are in pain. Who are lonely. Who have suffered loss. For these opportunities remind me that I am truly human. A human living a human experience. That I'm alive. That I have a heart. It makes the world a better place. Once my heart is touched with my sense of empathy ignited within me, I am then driven to action, to compassion, to help those whose experiences profoundly move me in this way. Now, as many of you guys know, I love ancient Greek. And, of course, I couldn't resist because this word, empathy, is a Greek word. And, and so many people misunderstand these words because we don't even know what they mean by definition. So, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. The definition, what is empathy? It's a Greek word, uh, comes from empatheia. It directly means physical affection, passion, and partiality. The Greek word empatheia is really a combination with two words. This is important, but this is just all Greek to me. I know it is. <laughs> That's why I'm going to be translating it. Okay. The preposition N, which means in or at, and the word pathos, usually translated as passion, suffering, and experience. The full meaning then, excuse me, is that empathy is the action of experiencing the other person's thoughts and feelings with the aim of identifying with them, matching their own feelings with their own, and then hopefully to help uh, or identify with them. You see, using the Greek, you have to enter into their experiences, right? Enter into their experiences in order to be where they are at. So the Greek is an important in discerning what this word means. Now, of course, we've referred to the word uh, impact before, and that is uh, oftentimes used uh, in a uh, supernatural gift or ability to be able to read a person's thoughts and feelings. Well, let's take that on a human level. That's basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to be intuitive of these actions. Oh, good, this is going to matter just fine. Right? But empathy versus sympathy. You saw in the video earlier, uh, there's a difference between the two, but sometimes these ideas blur. So we're going to go into this. Sympathy, right? Well, sympathy, of course, means getting together pathos with somebody's experiences. Do you see a difference there? You're getting together with it as opposed to getting into it. You're coinciding yourself with those, those feelings of somebody else, but you're not actually directly putting yourself into it. So the grief, again, is all important. Right? Sympathy. Empathy. Uh, when one is sympathetic, one implies pity but maintains distance from another person's feelings. Empathy is more a sense that one can truly understand or match the depth of another person's feelings. I like this. It implies feeling with a person rather than feeling sorry for the person. Feeling with the person, not feeling sorry for them. Let's give an example. For example, uh, a loved one uh, suffers a tragic loss or something, they lose something, and so we, we send off what's called a, a sympathy card, right? Or a sympathy email, or we give a sympathy phone call. There's nothing wrong with that. Sympathy is not a bad thing, right? Well, and so what you're going to say is things like, well, we're sorry for your loss. I'm sorry that, you know, something bad happened to you. Really sorry. What I'm going to say, this is oftentimes what I'm talking about, is that sympathy is the starting process for everything. Right? You do the same thing. You do 
still send out that email. You still send them that special card. You still make that phone call. You still are sympathetic. You're still getting together, you know, in that person's experience. But then empathy suddenly goes into that person's experience. What does that mean? Suddenly, after that phone call, after that card, you're on a fact gathering mission. That's right. You're gathering facts, attempting to find out as much information as possible about that person's situation. Does that make sense? You're going out there and you're going to learn more about it. Right? Followed by a concentrated act of putting yourself in their position, putting yourself into their shoes. Imagine how it would be losing that person from their perspective. And then from there, helping them in a specialized and catered fit to their particular need manner. That's right. You're going to find out what they need and you're going to cater your actions based upon their needs. Not based upon a generic perspective or what you should do or what other people do, but especially catered to their particular needs, requirements, and sometimes it may be a little unorthodox. You may be doing something for, for somebody because you know what they need, but, but other people say, what are you doing that for? You know, it doesn't seem right. Or it doesn't seem, you know, the point is because you know that person, you know what they need. Okay, moving right along though, of course, that means that, that when it comes to, there's differences. We've all tasted caregiving, uh, uh, caregiving industries, right? Caregivers, doctors, right? I want to tell you something. A doctor is required to be sympathetic. They are. But they're not required to be empathetic. Think to yourself, I know many of you go to the doctors for various reasons. Why don't you find yourself not a sympathetic doctor? Find yourself an empathetic doctor. A sympathetic doctor, he'll listen to you, which is wonderful. He'll listen. Yeah, yeah I understand you. You guys know the drill. And then he'll, he'll give you some medication, some pills, some placebos, or whatever it may be. And that will take care of the problem. You know the doctors. You don't feel like you've got the full experience. An empathetic doctor is somebody that goes in there, and yeah, he'll give you the same pills, but he'll also really listen to your life. Where are you at? What your needs are? And get to the heart of the situation, and you know what? An empathetic doctor may even change your prescription to something else. See how that works? Something else that he now knows you really need, or really require, or he'll make some suggestions. Because all of a sudden, what he did is he entered into your world and realized that giving just a pill or a simple prescription that he gives everybody else is not enough. Your needs needs to be cater fit. You need to find that kind of a doctor. And if you have a doctor that's just simply sympathetic, that's wonderful, that's great. But I think you should find another doctor. Are you guys following? The same thing goes with the therapist. You know the therapist, right? You know, sympathetic, oh yeah, yeah, they sit there, and they listen, they listen. And after a while, you're just realizing they're just listening. And listening's not enough. There's got to be involvement. Of course, we have these wonderful ministers here. But to be a good minister, you need to be sympathetic and empathetic. But other than that, what about family members, right? We need to be sympathetic as well as empathetic to family members. And then what about humanitarian situations? I hope that all our ambassadors out there, our diplomats, are not just sympathetic to the needs of their countries. I really hope that they're empathetic. You know, there's a struggle with a various with a various group of people, let's say within the nation, and you know, and you say, oh, I'm really sorry about what's happening. Is that going to heal the situation? Is that going to cure the situation? You have to get into that person's shoes, that cultural perspective, and see it from the inside out. Otherwise, diplomacy will inevitably fail. Right? But let's, let's take a few cases here. You, uh, when it comes to empathy, you run into a close friend, 
who has obviously been crying and her mascara is running. There's a few things you can do. Okay, let's, let's all be honest. We're going to have fun, but I still want you to be honest with yourself. When you see somebody like that, many of us do this. I didn't see him. I didn't see him, right? Looks like they're down. And, and, and what's the first thing you're worried about? Do I have time to, to deal with the situation, right? Let's be honest. We think that a lot. We see somebody, they're, they're obviously miserable, and we immediately shut down our hearts, and we, we go the other direction. But let's just say that person approaches us. We ask what's wrong. They tell us. What are we going to do then? Well, there's a few things that we can do. Sympathy means we'll say, I feel so bad for you. That's great. <laughs> that doesn't a lot of good, right? I feel so bad for you. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Or how about this one? Your life is never easy. Every time you turn around, something bad happens. Because we need that kind of observation, right? We need to have that, that, that clinical examination of your life. You know, every time something bad's happening, so I just can't believe it. <laughs> you have also the worst one. The, the one where you say something with no meaning to help you all together. You say, I don't know what I would do if I were you. <laughs> right? Right? I don't know what I'd do. You, know? you throw up your hands. I don't know what you do. Well, thanks. <laughs> Helpful. Now, having said that, if you say that and you follow by a hug, there's a whole other, see, does, does that make sense? There's a whole other thing going on. But if you just simply say that, that's a problem, right? But, you know, another thing that I noticed by looking up this word and going into various meanings is that we, we automatically think that empathy is all about negative feelings. Right? All about sad feelings. We do. Whenever we hear about empathy, you know, yes, I'll we'll, we'll have some tear-jerking illustrations here coming up where empathy is a big part of it, but it's also more than just that. Empathy is about positive feelings, too. Did you know that? And people go, what? It's like sympathy. It's, it's always kind of, you know, more negative. No, it's not. When a person hears great news, exciting news, and it comes to you, what you want to do is walk in their shoes, see why they're experiencing something that's so exciting, understand that with the worldview, and celebrate with them. That is empathy as well. Did you guys know that? It's more than just being, you know, upset. It's being happy with somebody. Understanding that uh, they're excited. Well, I have to say this, and I will. Sometimes when they say something that's so exciting, we can care less about it. There we go. You know, somebody comes back and says, Oh, I just got a chance to meet the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take a deep breath. They're happy. All right, so it's okay. Many of you are fans. I'm saying, all right, what you do is what you want to do is you get into their mindset. They, well, you know, they watch them all the time on TV. They always talk about it. They're excited about it. This is an exciting experience. You should say, wonderful, let's go celebrate. You guys are waking up, right? Or if I say, hey, you know what? I just won. Who's excited? I just won. Uh, tickets to the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas for three days. All three days. And you guys look at me and you go, so what? You know, or, or the famous, that's nice. Right? Well, you know, this is your moment. Come on, you're friends with this person. Get into their experience. Understand their world from the inside. Why it's so exciting. Hey, this, this guy up you know, on the podium here, you know, he's been watching Star Trek since 1974. He's a huge fan, you know. I can see where this is exciting. I'm happy for you. And let's have a theme party. Does that, you guys follow me? Especially if you're close to that person. So remember, empathy is more than just feeling bad about somebody. It's tuning up your radar, be sensitive, intuitive to even when people are happy. And I always say, if somebody's happy and you're happy with them, it's happiness that's doubled. Or tripled, or quadrupled. You guys follow? Because it's that kind of positive feeling that really makes for a better world, does it not? Join into those experiences. 
celebrate. Now, of course, I'm going to uh, say how to be empathetic in six easy steps, but you know that's not easy. But I'll go ahead and give you a few examples. First, what was become emotionally available in general? Allowing themselves to become more sensitive to the world around them. We have to become more sensitive. We have to get out of our particular social group or whatever we're a part of. And we have to open up our minds to other perspectives, ideas, beliefs, conceptions. We have to be open. We have to be sensitive. And in some cases, we have to get rid of a lot of emotional garbage to be able to have that sensitivity. It's important, right? Sensitivity. Okay. Number two, one must be prepared to do some fact gathering which may involve many questions or simply listening to that person for an extensive period of time. Get ready to listen. Now, listening, what is listening? That means you actually look at the person as they talk. But by the way, don't overlook. You know, you know those people who say, I really care for you. And they're like, this close to your face. Tell me what's wrong. You're like, well, um, I, you know, not doing well, you know, don't do that. Don't be invasive. What you want to do is still look at them, don't do this. Oh, that's pretty good, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right, don't do that. Don't do the cell phone thing. Don't, don't also, you know, start making a mental list of uh, things you need for grocery shopping or whatever maybe, you know. Be there for them the whole way through. Third, one must realize that the other person's world is not the same as your own. It is very unique. And so you have to prepare yourself to enter that world. We, as individuals, by the way, are self-contained universes. And we're, each one of us are formed through a unique blend of influences. Okay? We are, for instance, we have different genetic dispositions, environmental influences, intentional and unintentional instructions we have accumulated through life. We have random combinations of formative experiences and according to some past life experiences, right? So that means that every one of us, we're all different. You may think I'm doing one talk here today. I am not doing one talk here today. I'm doing, uh, how many people are in this room? I'm just saying, I'm doing huh? 60. 60 different talks. Mm -hmm. 60 completely different talks because you're listening to me through your own grid and experiences. And that means that we're all different. So we have to get into each individual person to understand them. Does that make sense? That's why we don't perceive music or, or uh, uh, movies or whatever we like to do in our lifetime the same because we have different things that have formed us, have merged us, have put us together. Fourth, uh, uh, you must now learn to walk in the other person's world, their shoes, to understand them from their own worldview. We have to withdraw, withdraw to be a judgment. <clears throat> we can't judge a person because that judgment gets in our way of our sensitivity. We have to have a blank slate. Tava rasa. So, for example, and when people say get into somebody's shoes, it's more than just getting into somebody's shoes. Here it is. For example, <clears throat> I'm going to play with this if you don't mind. Getting into somebody's proverbial shoes. We have to know exactly what kind of shoes they're usually wearing. Right? Think about it. Uh, are they moving through life wearing sandals or sneakers? Track shoes or tap shoes? High heels or hiking boots? Dress shoes or neck shoes? Are their shoes new or deeply worn or even falling apart? Are their shoes used often or very little? And where do these shoes go, right? You know, do they go to the mountains? Do they go to the river? Do they go, where do they go? And are they used to walking on hard, hot pavement? or grass. We have to, so these shoes are individual. We have to understand them. Fifth, now after walking in their shoes, you can move to actually identifying with that person's feelings in the world, finding points in common with yourself. At that moment, we have moved 
to our goal from there. At this point, we can move <coughs> truly from empathy to compassion. Six, after that, actually offer help or be proactive in doing some action with them. Now, let's get to some personal experiences. Um, uh, as many of you know, uh, I was very close to a lady by the name of Corey Tim Boo. Uh, Corey Tim Boo uh, was involved in saving many Jews in the Netherlands. Uh, she had a special secret hiding place and uh, saved literally thousands of individuals. And then what happened is, is because uh, of a traitor, she was arrested and she was put into a concentration camp. And because of a clerical error, she was released. And she decided that she's going to forgive the Germans for what they did to her. I was raised by that individual. 1974, uh, she came to me, and she, this time she's busy with movies and books and everything else, but she saw the suffering of, of this, uh, this eight-year-old kid and put it all aside and decided to become my grandma. And I saw her all the time. But the point is, I want to say this, is that she had to replace my grandparents. And there's a reason why I'm talking about this. Okay, the reason is, and I'll go into this, and I'll, this will be my bit here. What happens is this, is that my, uh, my, on my mom's side, my grandparents, they were raised in the background where, you know, kids are, are, are to be seen and not heard. You've heard that before. So they, they didn't relate with us. On my father's side, my grandma decided that she played favorites. I was a lesser kid. My older brother was the best kid in the entire world, and she was not very friendly about it. That I was always kind of treated in a terrible way. Uh, one time she threw out all my homemade books, for example. You know, she was not very nice. She was very protective of my brother. Not my brother, but I was always resentful of that. And that, that resentment continued into uh, going into my adult years. And then in April of 1998, we all went to visit her, and she's dying. She's on her deathbed. And, you know, I didn't tell you. She was all eyes. Uh, you know, she was just, just toothpicks for arms and legs, and she was sitting there. The life was moving out of her. And I was so upset at that time, and I looked at her, and there she was. And I also realized something else. Everybody in the room, they were talking to her. In some cases, there are 22 people in the same room. They're all talking amongst themselves. And there she sat. And then I thought, oh, and I started judging them. And I thought to myself, no, 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 I shouldn't judge them. Because they don't know how to deal with that. They're scared of that. And sometimes when we're scared of that, we remove ourselves from them. Does that make sense? So there's a reason I have to be empathetic and understand. There's a reason why they are doing what they're doing. They're not trying to be cruel. But at the same time, there she sat. And I thought to myself, I'm going to relieve that past. I'm... And so I go up, and I sit next to her, and I hold her hand. And I talk to her. Because I remember that, that, that she loved to be the center of attention. She loved to be busy. And the, the last thing that she'd ever want to be doing is sitting in a hospital bed being a And that's exactly what was happening. It was her nightmare. And so I talked with her. I brought my daughter, almost, almost two at the time, and we both held her hand. And we talked with her. You know what happened? The life suddenly returned to her eyes. To the point where she's in hospice care. The nurse says, you can take her out on a wheelchair to see things. Revitalize. This is amazing what happens. And then, of course, the last day that we're all supposed to leave came. This is Palo, Iowa. And my, my parents are about to leave. I said, well, are we gonna, are we gonna pray for her? Not that I wanted to pray for her. It's, it's just what we do. She loved tradition. This was important to her. And my parents were just about to take off. I said, we need to pray. And my dad said, we gotta pray. So I had to pray as I held her out her hand. And and I had to pray for God to show her love. And I felt something change inside of me. And I realized she's a person just as important as me with wants, needs, desires that need to be met. And I looked in my eyes, there's tears in my other face. All her life, 
She said, my John, that's my brother's name. My John, my John. And the last, first and last time in her life, she looked up and said, my John. It wasn't about me. It's not about my story. I wasn't looking to have that achievement or that accomplishment. That wasn't the point. It, it, it ended up there was just nothing. That's, it's not about your ego. It's altruistic. It's all about you doing the action, not expecting a reward in return. This is what empathy is all about. And we can go to the other illustrations because you know I oftentimes write way too much. And empathy is an action. Right? It is an action. But I just want to close with a few things that we need to deal with in five quick points. Empathy is a lifestyle. Here it is. First, an essential part of empathy is actually being interested in other people and their lives in general. Two, make yourself grow by reaching out to people you have in the past placed under a general label. So that label may be challenged by your interpersonal uh, interaction. Go to people who are faith systems and beliefs and ideas and cultural backgrounds that are outside of your own and get to know them. Understand who they are. Third, develop your imagination that allows you to fill in the gaps for what the other person may be feeling, even if you don't have enough personal details to understand them. Fourth, practice what is called experimental empathy. The whole idea is walk a mile in somebody else's shoes for a while. Like, for instance, your mom or, or family member. Get into their worldview. Fifth, begin to see others as important as you are, as equal to your own position, avoiding all stereotypes. And finally, make certain your goal in connection with someone on this level is altruistic, not driven by ego. And as a result, the world will absolutely become a better place. I had one person says, you know, empathy, full-on empathy, it's not, it's, it can't happen. No one can be fully empathetic. So why even try? And I say this, you know what? We'll never have pure water, perfectly clean water. So why do we, why do we even deal with purification? Yeah, it's useless. It'll never be fully clean. Why even do the effort? Hey, why? Why don't you strive for world peace? We'll never achieve world peace. You know why? You know? You know why even try? And I say, because the effort alone is important. Remember, empathy is, is what we hear, but it's also connected directly to how we respond to it. And I want you today to think of your lives as a new empathetic life to bring things together. And you'll see a big difference. Thank you. Mm -hmm.